So our next speaker is uh, Rohit Jha, engineer and CEO at Transcestual, a Singapore-based space technology startup. Rohit, the stage is yours. Thank you, Dan. Um, hi, everyone. I'm incredibly excited to be here in front of all of you. Um, thank you, Steve, for giving me the opportunity to come and speak here. Um, thank you, Howard and MIT, for organizing, organizing such an amazing event. Uh, it's exciting that outer space has made an amazing comeback in becoming the next frontier to develop technologies for. Right, sorry. Um, so right off the bat, I would like to talk about something extremely cool. Uh, this is Breakthrough Initiative. It's a $100 billion uh, foundation started by uh, three big billionaires, Yuri Miller, Mark Zuckerberg, and a big scientist, Stephen Hawking. One of the aims of the group is to send a really tiny, wafer-thin satellite to our closest star system, Alpha Centauri, which is 4.37 light years away, in the next couple of decades. This is a massive engineering and scientific challenge. I had a call with Pete, uh, director of engineering of Starshot Initiative, last year. Uh, one of the main challenges we talked about was that once the satellite reaches the other star system and takes pictures of a supposed potential habitable planet, how is it going to send the data back to us across the vast expanse of space in, considerable, in reasonable timelines? The answer lies in what we are doing at Transcelestial. Humans have been trying to communicate uh, since the dawn of civilization. I would like to think of as fire, the, the one of the first forms of communication. What it, uh, its purpose was to signal safety and warmth. Since then, our tools have improved aimed to enhance two parameters. First, speed of information transfer. The second, amount of information conveyed. Every single time we have understood the underlying world and built technology to communicate, our civilization has moved forward. In this progress, two dominant forms of communications have emerged, wired and wireless. We have progressed a lot on the wired front. Now, you had Newton's laws of motion on one hand, but beneath, we have known a more fundamental description of nature since the early 1900s, defined by quantum mechanics. Maxwell's equations, along with Volta's and Marconi's technology, gave rise to telegraph, radio broadcast, and telecommunications. But it was special theory of relativity and the work done by Fitzgerald and Lorentz that brought light to the same domain and we got our cosmic upper limit of speeds. We replaced telegraph lines, as you can see in the picture, uh, with fiber optics to reroute internet across the world's biggest hubs and connected countries and continents. On the wireless front, though, we are still using radio waves to transfer information, a technology first used in 1887. In all honesty, they have actually worked really well. Uh, especially to usher us into the mobile age. But now, finally, we are starting to see cracks in the use of RF and radio frequency. So I'll show you two graphs. The first one on the left takes UAVs as an example, but really reflects all wirelessly connected systems terrestrially. It shows how radio waves for connected devices on the ground is starting to get congested, especially as we are looking beyond 10 gigabits. Things are not really great when you look up in space as well. Uh, the graph on the right shows limits of radio waves from data rate perspective of satellites. To put things in perspective, currently, one third of the satellites in orbit cannot beam back all of the data that they generate on board. These are huge investments that we spend up, and not being able to get that data back down is a massive, massive drawback. These graphs are very simple, but they highlight the massive explosion in data needs brought by better electronics and better optics that we are seeing, and as well as increasingly connected devices. Now, what do you, uh, the multicolored picture that you see is the chart of our congested spectrum. Uh, and the next big problem that I'm going to talk about is spectrum congestion. To explain a bit to the non-technical people in the audience, all your wireless communication works on radio frequencies. And radio frequencies have bands where you can put data in. 
since these bands are limited, the data you can channel in is limited as well. So if you start pushing in more and more data, you start to get back errors and you lose your data. So that spectrum doesn't get congested, regulators like IMDA in Singapore regulate these uh, spectrums and sell it. Uh, to give an example, the 4G spectrum, the, uh, the 4G network that was rolled out in Singapore costed the, the three telcos around $360 million to buy. In bigger countries like India and Thailand, these, fact, these costs go up in billions of dollars. With congestion increasing due to more connected CCTVs, Internet of Things, and cell towers, more spectrum is needed in an already spectrum-starved economy. Now, spectrum congestion is a big area of concern for all of us. Why? You do not want your urgent call to the hospital dropped when there is a medical emergency. And you do not want your self-driving car to lose connection when it is traveling at 150 kilometers per hour on an expressway. Satellites are facing a similar problem and have moved up to higher RF bands like KA and KU to adjust. But these, these transitions come with their own size, weight, power, and cost challenges. Now, this is a massive, massive satellite. This is Viasat-1. It's the largest bandwidth satellite ever made. The combined bandwidth is staggering. It's 140 gigabits per second, over 56 antennas and transponders. But to give, put things in perspective, its size is that of roughly two double-decker buses. It weighs as much as four cars and consumes as much power as a house in a developed economy. Guys, this is it. This is the state of the art that we can get right now with RF. The best uh, consumer data downlinks that we can get from this is 15 megabits per second, which means to download a 4K movie, you would need around 15 hours. So the question is, where do we go from here? RF is getting crowded, expensive, and is not suitable for what we want in terms of more higher data rates. Turns out our good old friend physics has an answer for us, and something we have been employing within fiber for decades now. The key to solving our problem is light, more precisely, lasers. This is what we are building at Transcelestial Technologies. It's a laser communication system for satellites, which works in tandem with a network of smart optical connected ground telescopes. These ground stations are used for data downlinks and uplinks. They provide an ultra high bandwidth, low powered, small sized, instantly deployable, unjammable, secure, long distance communication solutions, which do not need a spectrum regulation. Eventually, we aim to provide up to 100 gigabits of bandwidth, which means you can download a 4K movie in just eight seconds. We are right now in the process of growing from a small team of researchers to one of the best in the world. We are in a race to define this technology for the next 20, 30, 40 years. And it is incredibly fun. It's the kind of thing that gets you up in the morning and is worth spending your life on. Trying to do something which is not clear whether it's technically possible, if done, changes the world. It just goes nothing, 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 and then everything is different. Very briefly, to get into the core of our technology, it's a free space optic solution with extremely accurate pointing, acquisition, and tracking. For a moment, I would like to delve a bit deeper in for the more technically-minded audience sitting here. Uh, this is how it works, two steps. First one, we encode satellite data using electro-optic modulation uh, of a laser around 1.5 micro, uh, micrometers using a high-rate power-efficient DAC. The second step, we then take that laser, point it back down to Earth using a two-step rough course correction and jitter control. It's also guided by a bi-directional closed-loop feedback control system from the ground. This allows us to achieve micro-radiant pointing accuracies. It's the equivalent of sitting in San Francisco and pointing very accurately inside a New York Manhattan building and a small picture frame inside that uh, flat. Um, Right, so the obvious thing is we need to test this technology in the real world and make sure it's extremely reliable. To do that, we are going through four phases, as you can see, testing it on the ground, testing it on the air, testing it at extremely high altitudes, and finally, testing it in space, in low Earth orbit. In each phase, we have identified uh, potential partners to work with and are currently in talks. 
These include some of the world's biggest communication, aerospace, and satellite companies. What fiber optics has done down here, we are trying to do up there. While traveling under intense radiation, temperature differences of up to 500 degrees, and speeds of 25,000 kilometers per hour. The question here is, why is it worth doing in the first place? Because this sounds incredibly hard. This is a really broad technology and has massive implications on various terrestrial and space applications. Its value proposition is different depending on where it will be applied, what it will be applied to. It is an equivalent of jumping from dial-up to broadband in terms of possibilities. It's massive. I briefly want to discuss just two possibilities of what we think the future for individuals and businesses alike will be with something like this. The first thing is ultra-high-speed internet access anywhere. When I mean anywhere, I mean anywhere. I really mean anywhere, anywhere on the planet. And I really, really mean anywhere, anywhere in our solar system, anywhere beyond that. That is where the, this technology's scaling abilities lie. With a portable ground station, you should be able to get a multiple multi-gigabit connection for an individual or a small community. That means streaming higher bitrate movies easily and cheaply. The second use case is for businesses. Our aim is to launch a low Earth orbit, high data rate constellation of relay satellites using laser comm links. So what this allows us to do is reroute connections across the globe through the shortest path mathematically possible at the highest speed currently possible. This means a financial market trader sitting in Tokyo will be able to get prices from New York 100 milliseconds faster. For those who have spent some time in the finance industry, this is a massive game changer for electronic markets. We have a highly technical core team, and we have surrounded ourselves with top-class mentors in business, photonics, and space industry to guide us along the journey. We are in the process of building a team of motivated engineers and scientists who like working on truly world-changing problems. So I would like to encourage any bright, young, or experienced minds in the audience to talk more uh, with me, get hold of me outside after this talk. I want to take a step back uh, before I finish and talk about our mission. Our mission, simply put, is to push the boundaries of communication for the evolution of our civilization. Now, what this means, uh, in a nutshell, is that we are not just building like super cool laser communication devices and ground stations, because they sound cool. We want to look at our planet more closely in order to take better care, and we want to connect to every person without being too expensive. Something like this gives us and our team something to sink our teeth into, something more tangible than photons. Uh, I'd like to end on this slide. Uh, the picture on your left is Telstar. It's one of my favorite pictures. Uh, this is the first communications relay satellite to stream audio, images, live video, and telephone calls across the Atlantic from the US to the UK and Europe. It had so many firsts. The components, the system design, and the technology is still most of what we use today and has shaped our progress. This was done by just a handful of guys in a small town of Murray Hill, surrounded by forests. This was the headquarters of the incredible Bell Labs, which produced 15 Nobel laureates, three Turing Award winners, and countless inventions. This is what happens in a hard tech organization, a small bunch of committed people achieving incredulous feats. Hopefully, our efforts here to recapture even just a fraction of their impact pulls at your heartstrings. Thank you for listening.